of unsustainable deficits has costs, including an increased possibility of a sudden fiscal crisis. As we've seen in a number of countries recently, interest rates can soar quickly if investors lose confidence in the ability of a government to manage a fiscal policy. We can be sure that without corrective action, our fiscal trajectory will move the nation ever closer to the point. It's like Ben Bernanke's been reading the same things I have. He knows what's going on. But why does he keep printing? He keeps printing because he has no other choice. They're, they're backed into a corner. And that's kind of scary. But don't worry, we have a plan. Um, and Alan Greenspan tells us what the plan is. The United States can pay any debt it has because we can always print money to do that. So there's zero probability of default. So when, um, when the U.S. had its credit rating um, lowered uh, last year, um, Timothy Geithner was out there on, the new, on every news channel saying, these people are crazy, they're crazy, absolutely nuts, these are fringe nuts. Um, because they lowered our credit rating, but there's zero percent chance of us defaulting. We can't possibly default. These people are crazy. And this is what he's talking about, because he's right. <coughs> Technically he's right. There is zero possibility of default because we can always print more dollars. But uh, this, um, uh, Ron Paul put a different spin on it. He says the only argument is going to be how to default. Not send the checks or just print the money. In all countries our size, they always print the money. So this isn't even a secret. They're not even trying to keep this from us. But for some reason, the, the press thinks that, you know, Sarah Jessica Parker's new boyfriend is more important than the, the you know, latest Twilight movie is out, you know. <laughs> You've all heard of Al Gore's hockey stick chart. Well, this is the Federal Reserve's hockey stick chart. You can see the M0. M0 is basically just coins and bills in circulation. So it's one measure of money supply. And it just goes merrily along here. It goes up a little bit. And then about 2009, just goes crazy. Um, it's out of control. And they're, they're uh, backed into a corner. And they're desperate. I, I couldn't see. What's that? I couldn't see how many, what the, what the um, oh. factor was as far as increase. And so I, let's I see. What is that on your left? Is that 1995 or something? Um, this is, uh, the blue line starts about 1984. Okay. And then 2009 right here. I think it looks like put up right about there. a factor of five or six. Um, let's see, this is about <coughs> 200 right here. Billion, two hundred billion dollars. Well, what a factor over ten. And then it went up to yeah, to almost a thousand billion, almost a trillion. So it went up almost five times. And then it's really gone crazy. So a little over eight hundred to twenty eight hundred right here. So it's just really gone nuts. In only three years. Yeah, this is just in a few years. Yeah. And as you can see from the quotes from Ben Bernanke and uh, Alan Greenspan, they have no plans of stopping this. So, but how could all of this happen? Well, we've covered part of this before, but just to recap. The theories of Lord John Maynard Keynes. He is the, um, I guess it, it's appropriate that he's a lord because um, he's the orthodoxy in the Western world today. And How do you say that in, in Latin again? Domin, domin. Oh, uh, Dominus et Deus. Okay. Lord and God. Yeah, Lord and God, exactly. <laughs> and he's not to be questioned. His theories are economics to most politicians. There's no <coughs> distinction whatsoever between his theories and, econo and economics, quote unquote. As we saw, just saw the Federal Reserve also made it happen with its inflation. And the third one we haven't talked about, but we don't need to because we all are familiar <laughs> with this, that government checks equal votes. We've seen in a lot of recent elections. Anytime you rob Peter to pay Paul, you can always count on the vote of Paul. 
Well, somebody said America just had a IQ <coughs> test November 6th. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So, where do the solutions lie? Well, the Keynesians, we already talked about their solutions. They're going to solve our ballooning federal debt with more debt. And we're all richer if we print more money. But that's a, even though that doesn't make any sense, you know, if you, if you explain this all to a 12-year-old, they would say, well, that doesn't make any sense. But since there's an economic orthodoxy that's taught in all of the universities, the Keynesians see no problem with this. They just go, yeah, well, we'll just get more debt. That's okay. We'll just print more money. Not a problem. Where does it all come from? Well, you got to remember, the government doesn't produce anything. The government has no money. So the government has to get it by borrowing it, printing it, or they get it from you. Um, what, so we're talking about solutions. Are there solutions in our own history? Well, one, one solution that we don't want to follow is a uh, set of solutions is from the 1929 Depression. Um, you know, I've heard people talk about, oh, well, we need to, to do what FDR did in the Depression. That will get us all going and everything. But you've got to think about this. So it started in 1929. It lasted at least 12 years. Some people say 17 years. But let's just say it's 12. If we entered a Depression today and we did all of the same things as they did in 1929, we can expect to come out in 2024. No problem, right? Mm -hmm. um, optimistically, I might add. So something's a little bit crazy about that. And um, as I said, that, that was the dawn of Keynesian policymaking. And, but what you want to contrast that with is the Depression of 1920. This is something almost nobody knows about. And there's a reason. It was a very severe depression that started in 1920, but nobody reads about it in the history books because it ended a year and a half later. And so nobody cares about it. Nobody, nobody studies it. <coughs> Why study it? It was just a real short incident. But unemployment was over 10%, and the market crashed 47%. It was a very severe depression. So, well, let's think about that. So we had a severe depression in 1920. What did we do about it? The government did absolutely nothing. That's what they did. They said, we're a capitalist society. We we, um, we have confidence in the markets. People got ahead of themselves. They have too many debts. We need to let the debts clear out. The companies that took on bad debts, they need to go to bankruptcy court and need to get it fixed. And a year and a half later, it was all over. And there's a modern equivalent of this, Iceland. Iceland had a banking crisis recently when all their real estate prices dropped and the banks were stuck with bad debts and they're all jumping up and down. Save us, save us, save us. And the Icelandic government said, no, I don't think so. I think we'll all let you all go bankrupt. Well, they're recovering now. They're doing actually quite nicely. And this has happened to two years ago, three years ago, something like that, just recently. Um, and this is a little bit more. If you get my slide deck, you can read more about it, but I won't go over it. So another thing about solutions is um, recently we've been, we've been hearing a lot in politics about, well, should we do tax increases or spending cuts? So here's a nice little fact. All federal income tax receipts um, add up to about $1.3 trillion, but the federal deficit is $1.5 to $1.6 trillion a year. <coughs> So if you doubled everybody's income taxes, you can't fix this. It's not enough money. That's how bad it is. So if, if you pay $5,000 a year in income taxes, now you have to pay 10. Oh, and guess what? We didn't fix the problem. We just made it a little bit better for now. But oh, hey, look at all these delicious things we can spend the money on over here. So we need to vote for fiscally responsible politicians and people who understand economics. Because, um, you know, probably you're going to have to have some of both, I would guess. I'm not sure. That's for the politicians to fill it, figure out. But basic math tells us it can't be just tax increases. And Jim, in 2013, <coughs> they say that the increase in taxes with the new Obama increases would be about $4,300 per family. Wow. Uh, if they make around 70 to 100,000 a year. Jeez. 
That's kind of scary. And that's not going to fix the problem. And that will fix the problem. No. Yeah. So I'm almost done here, but I wanted to share one more quote with you um, that I think is real interesting. This Porter Stansberry is a financial writer who's, who's actually very smart and rich. And there's a reason, because he understands what's going on. He said, if I could magically wave a wand and change just one thing about my fellow citizens, I'd make them realize paper money backed by nothing is a crime. What's scariest to me is how this anger is manifesting itself in Occupy Wall Street movement. These folks are blaming capitalism for these problems, but this has nothing to do with capitalism. Paper money was Marx's idea. But try explaining that to any of these folks. So here's our buddies Marx again. Even though the Soviet Union has fallen and everything, he's still invading our lives. He invented paper money as a means of control. And uh, boy, does that ever work. Now there are some, there, just so no, you know, you don't all look for the highest bridge to drive off of on the way home. There are some, there is some good news. Um, it, the bad news is all in the government, but there's a lot of good news outside of the government. And to have a balanced view, you want to think about these too. Um, there's a huge U.S. oil boom going on right now, and it's going to help our balance of trade. We'll even be exporting gas here probably about 2015 when they can uh, get the export facilities done. So this will help us quite a bit. So it's, it's nice a tailwind in an era of headwinds. There's a lot of medical advances, technical, uh, nanotechnology, computer technology. And finally, there is some awareness growing of their fiscal condition. So there is a real danger of a large abrupt currency crash. That's maybe not 100% certain that it would just happen abruptly. It's likely but not 100% certain. But what is certain is a long-term devaluation of the dollar. So you need to protect yourself. But what's interesting is that stocks and some other assets, before our reserve, we, before we lose our reserve currency, some stocks and whatnot may actually benefit from this because people are like, what do I do with my money? Well, I'll go buy stocks. I can't put it in CDs. So that's kind of an interesting aspect of this. And keep in mind that this could all go on for years before there's a final day of reckoning. So you may not want to just play defense you know, in your investments. Um, you might want to look for some opportunities as, as well. Could, could be months too though. But it could be months or weeks. Mm -hmm. yep. And so you have to prepare for both. And if I could convince people to do just one thing after looking at all of this, I would, I would say get some physical silver and or gold because it's, nobody, it's nobody's liability. It's not, it's not something that can disappear overnight. The value can go down temporarily, and it has done that. And, um, but you need to have some silver and gold to, um, to protect yourself, enough to make you sleep at night. Well, what's the latest thing coming out from the administration? that they want to find out where all the gold is. Oh, so you've heard about that. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? I, I don't know. You know, actually, personally, you know, I'm not a financial advisor, so I can't tell people what to do, and everybody's situation is different. But personally, the way I feel is I have a little bit of gold and a lot of silver. Because gold, it has happened in 1933 that it was confiscated by the government when they got in trouble. And so theoretically, could that happen? It could. It's possible. Um, now, does that mean that everybody would turn in their gold or just keep it and be quiet about it? I'm not sure. But that's your own personal decision. But um, Well, you could probably turn it in for the same price they gave you in 1933. Yeah, probably something like that. And, and they, did, they did exchange it for money. I mean, they didn't just take it. But So that's important to understand. But that it is possible that that could happen. But um, so personally, I have a lot more silver than I have gold dollar in dollar terms. Didn't they make it illegal to have gold? Yeah, they did. Mm -hmm. You know, and they were going to the safe deposit boxes and things they like did. that? They did. What they did was um, uh, FDR got in, and they just, boom, they said, we're having a banking holiday on Monday. They, they try to make it sound really nice. You know, it's a we're holiday. having a holiday. It's a holiday. What? Yeah, what, 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 
what, uh, how could anybody complain about a holiday? But what they did was they sealed everybody's safe deposit boxes. <coughs> and they had to be opened in the presence of an IRS agent. This all happened in 1933. And what they did was they, at that point, they exchanged whatever gold you had in your safe deposit box for dollars. And then, of course, they revalued the price of gold right after they did it. So they kind of ripped people off. But, um, but that's what they did with gold. So you have to be a little bit mindful. If things got really bad, you might want to be thinking about burying it in the mountains or something else. Well, and nobody knew that that was coming when, when FDR did that. They didn't. But, you know, things were pretty bad. You know, things were worse than they are now. So, I don't know. That's, those are all questions that I don't really have a good answer to. So, what does a, 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 what does a financial collapse look like? What does a failure of, it, of our money look like? Well, what ends up happening is, you know, gas might start going up. It might be $5 a gallon, then $10 a gallon, then $20 a gallon, and keep going like that. And anything that has to be imported goes up. Um, they might start uh, confiscating certain assets. They might close the borders so that um, financially close the borders so that people can't move money outside of the country. So that's another thing that they do. Um, <clears throat> and uh, just basic financial repression. Um, like one thing.